we are getting more and more practical when it comes to machine learning and deep learning. And by practical, I mean taking a research idea and putting it into production. Uh, we covered domain adaptation, which was about uh, the cases where your training data is going to end up having a different distribution from your test data. And it happens a lot when you take a machine learning framework and put it into production because you're going to have new users. In a similar fashion, when it comes to few shot learning, it could happen that you have new users with new images that you haven't labeled them yet. Therefore, these labels you haven't seen when you are training your model. And therefore, you need to be able to adapt fast, adapt your model fast to those new cases, new cases and new labels. There is another important topic, which is about federated learning. Uh, this, this is the case that without data, a data scientist, a machine learning engineer, or a deep learning engineer or scientist, they cannot do anything. Basically, data is the source code for deep learning and machine learning. We usually have some publicly available data on the internet, but there is a wealth of data sitting on our devices, on our cell phones. And our cell phones are getting uh, smarter when it comes to collecting data. If you look at your iPhones or your cell phones in general, if you look at their back, you can see that the number of cameras are increasing. And the more cameras you have, you can estimate the depth of your objects better. You are able to collect images better. And uh, each one of us, when we are using our devices, we use different languages. Or even if we are all using English, our English is going to be different among our own inner circle of friends and family. We use different words. And we want, uh, for instance, if you have a word completion application on a cell phone, to adapt to that particular user. These are becoming more and more personalized. Another application of federated learning is in the healthcare industry or in the finance industry. Why is that? Because in those industries, those industries are usually heavily regulated and the privacy of the data matters a lot. They are not willing the customers or the users of uh, uh, an application or the customers of a bank are not willing to share their data with a larger company. Therefore, we need to rethink our learning paradigm and federated learning is going to help us do so. At the same time, our devices, not only they have more sensors, they are getting better and better at compute. We have powerful iPhones or cell phones uh, in our hands. And these are usually the super compute computers of 10 years ago. And we have that much compute uh, on our devices that we carry with us all the time. And they have better sensors. And therefore, you're able to collect more data. Let it be images, let it be speech, voice, music, or GPS data, or any other data, temperature, uh, data about your healthcare, how many miles you walk per day, et cetera. What do we usually have when it comes to federated learning is that you usually have some clients think of smaller devices. And at the same time, there is a server which is going to hold the model. Each client is going to have their local training data. And for some reason, let it be privacy or practicality, we are not able to transfer the data to a server on the cloud. So the data is going to reside on the user devices. This is really important when it comes to financial industries and healthcare industries. We don't want to share your health records over the internet with a cloud computing uh, company. So you might think that if you are using the client devices to do training, you might say that this is very similar to distributed optimization. And uh, it is not actually true for mathematical and technological reasons. Let's see how federated learning is different. It's different from distributed learning or distributed optimization.
first of all, the data on each one of our devices is going to violate the IID assumption, identically distributed assumption, independent and identically distributed. Why is that? Because the data that is on my cell phone is going to be the type of pictures that I usually take or the type of text that I usually type on my device. And they are going to be heavily, heavily dependent on each other, those data. And the data on your devices is going to be dependent uh, on, on whatever that you're doing on your cell phones or on your devices. This is different from the IID assumption that is behind distributed optimization. That is one thing. The other one is unbalanced. On my device, maybe I take less pictures or more pictures than what you do with your cell phones. I might have only a handful of images on my cell phone and one of you might have tens of thousands of images. So the data is gonna end up being unbalanced. It's unbalanced, it's non-IID. They are massively distributed. When we are talking about distributed optimization, we usually have a cluster of, let's say, GPUs. And let's say we have around 100 of them, 100 GPUs trying to train a model. For federated optimization, you have millions of users. So it's massively distributed. These are from a mathematical perspective and a statistical perspective. From the technology perspective, we have limited computation, communication when it comes to federated learning. What do I mean? Sometimes a user, a user's device might be in a location with intermittent internet connection. Sometimes a user's device might be absent altogether. And these are usually low quality communication, unlike what you have with distributed optimization that you have uh, highly optimized network connections between your devices, between your clients, between your GPUs. So we have to deal with these challenges. What do you have? You have a number of clients, let's say K is denoting that, and it could be in the order of millions, and each one of them have their own data set. We don't want to transfer data because it's gonna end up being insecure. We want the data not to leave the user devices, and we want to protect their privacy. And you have K users, K clients, and C, is going to be a fraction of the clients that we are going to choose at random to help us train a model. What do we usually do? Let it be distributed optimization or federated optimization, or whenever we are doing training, we have a loss function. So FI is the loss function over an individual data, input output data. And you write a loss function, perhaps cross entropy if you're doing classification. And then you add up those. Uh, loss functions, individual loss functions, to give you the total loss function, which you are going to minimize with respect to the parameters of your model. So W denotes the parameters of your model. Each client, K, is going to have a set of data points or the set of indices of data points residing on client K, let's denote it by PK, and NK is the total number of uh, observations on that device, on your cell phone, on my cell phone. And uh, as I mentioned, NK could be different. Maybe N on my device is five, on your device is 100. So these could vary. Let's rewrite this formula for our loss function. And let's uh, do the summation first over the clients. We have K total number of clients, and then write the summation over the observations inside the device of that client. So all you're doing is breaking apart this summation into two summations. The inner summation, let's turn that into an average. Why would you do that? Because we want to deal with the unbalanced data now. If you turn it into average, then you can give weights according to the number of data points per each device. Now your total loss function is a summation over your clients. It's a weighted summation of the loss function per each client. Perfect. Now something nice happens. My device, your device, somebody else's device, we can make the IID assumption on them. So our devices 
is now being treated as data. And we have K devices, and things are going to be independent across K. Things are going to be dependent within the data for each individual client, but across clients, things are going to end up being or satisfying the IIDM assumption to some good approximation. Okay, We dealt with the unbalanced number of data per device, then non-ID non -ID assumption. Uh, we can make it IID if we think about clients as being data. So the clients are independent and we can assume that they have the same distribution. Okay, We dealt with non-IID unbalanced the massively distributed is actually an advantage. We are going to leverage that. And uh, limited communication, we need to deal with that. When it comes to federated learning, you don't have highly optimized network connection between your devices, and therefore communication costs are, dominate, are going to dominate. Now we need to reduce the number of communications between our devices and the server. How would you do that? Increase parallelism. For each iteration, use more of your devices, more of your clients as much as possible. At the same time, you are not bound to taking one stochastic gradient descent step inside each device. We can increase the computation, perhaps take a couple of steps of stochastic gradient descent, and then communicate the weights of your model with the server. And this is going to become more clear as I explain more. The algorithm is going to be called federated averaging. We are going to be doing large batch synchronous stochastic gradient descent. If C is one, C was the fraction of clients that you're going to select at random per each iteration. If it is one, you're selecting all of your uh, clients. If it is less than one, you're selecting a fraction of your clients. And usually we want C to be large because we want to reduce the number of communications between clients and the server. This way you're processing more data per each iteration for one round of communication. Let's see what we have. We have this loss per each device. We can compute the gradients locally. It means that the data for that client, for that user, doesn't need to leave their device. You compute the gradient on their device, assuming that there is enough computation computational power on those devices and your model is not too big. That's going to give you a gra gradient for that client. And then you can update your weights. We are going to use this formula here. You're basically taking the derivative of that loss and then do gradient descent and use this formula. And this is where nk over n is going to come in. You are giving different weights to different clients according to the number of data that they have. And this is basically the total gradient that you have. And this is all you need to update the parameters. But we are not done yet. Equivalently, this is why it is called federated averaging. You can have a global model, which is on the server. You select a fraction of your clients. You communicate that global model to those devices. On those devices, each one of them is going to take a step in the direction of their own gradients which is computed on their own data, that's going to give you a local model. This superscript K is important because now you have one model per each client. These are local models. Then uh, we can simply do a weighting, weighted average of those local models, and that's going to give you a global model. This operation is done on the server. This operation is done per each device. Why is this true? So I'm going to leave this as an exercise. This formula here is equivalent to what you have up there. Just take the definition of WT plus 1K, plug it here, and use the fact that the summation of these NKs over N is going to end up being 1. And then you're going to get the formula above. So these two are equivalent. But this is nice. Each device is going to take a step in the direction of the gradients computed based on their own loss function, they are going to have a local model. They're going to communicate the local model with the server, average them out. That's going to give you a new global model. When well, you keep repeating that process, this is one step of gradient descent. There's going to be a lot of communication because per each step, you are communicating these weights with the server. 
you can reduce that communication if you iterate more times per each device. Rather than taking one step of create and descent, you can take multiple steps per each device and then communicate. And this is this point two here, increase computation on each client. Is everything clear so far? Okay, perfect. Let's take a look at the algorithm. I just explained it, but to be more concrete, you have an initial model. You initialize it randomly. You're gonna take a couple of rounds. For each round, you're gonna select M clients. How do you select? How do you choose M? Perhaps if you set C to be a number less than one, this is the fraction of clients, fraction of the total clients that you're choosing. And this maximum is just for you to make sure that you're at least choosing one client in the cases that C times K is less than one. This ST is the set of those clients that you chose. Maybe my device and a couple of other devices from you. You go within the data or within the client. This is These operations are gonna happen in parallel. All of us are gonna do the same thing. We get the global model, take a couple of steps of gradient descent using our own local data. It's gonna give us our own local model. We communicate the local model with the server. The server does the averaging and then you repeat this process. What is this client update? You're gonna define your mini batch. You're gonna do a couple of local epochs for your mini batch data. And then you compute your, uh, you take your gradient descent step. So this is a sub function that you're calling here. And this is exactly the math that we went through. And you're doing this multiple times, uh, stochastic gradient descent steps. When it comes to federated learning, one thing that you need to keep track of is not your epochs, because that's not really important. What is important is you want to end up with an algorithm that's going to achieve a high accuracy using very few communications. So you need to keep track of the number of communications between the clients and the server. And then you want to achieve high accuracy in very few communication rounds. So communication rounds is what you need to keep track of. And then you have a couple of uh, hyperparameters to choose from. How many gradient descent steps are you gonna take per each client? That's E. What is your batch size per each client or mini batch size? The other one is what is your C? That's another hyperparameter. And uh, there is also another hyperparameter here. What should be the learning rate? And then you can study all of them. And you can see that uh, if you communicate less, whenever you're increasing E, you're reducing the number of communications, you can keep the byte size the same or mini byte size. And then uh, you see that in a few number of communications, you are able to achieve high accuracy. This is in the case of having IID data across your devices. It means that you're just dividing your data at random in a fair fashion. In an unfair fashion, you're going to distribute your data differently among your devices. Perhaps when it comes to MNIST, perhaps some of your devices are focusing on class one, some of your devices are focusing on class two, and this is going to end up being non-IIT non because all the images on one device are going to correspond to number one. Then in that case, you are not really that sensitive to the choices of these hyperparameters. In around 200 communications, you're able to achieve 99 test accuracy. You can do Shakespeare and use LSTM. This is for text. Or you can do c and play around with your learning rate. And learning rate is also important. Federated averaging is less sensitive to the choice of your learning rate. Any questions? Was everything clear? Okay, awesome.